This evening we are blessed to have another wonderful speaker. He is a canon lawyer and studied at our own Dominican Pontifical University in Rome, the Angelicum. Uh, he currently serves as director of the Tribunal and Department of Canonical Services here for the Archdiocese of Portland. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Father John Wood. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great privilege to be here. Um, and uh, I'd love to go to that Anglican Youth uh, Mass. I've never been to one before. Um, of course, it was England that had the first ordinariate uh, for the former Anglicans, the Ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham, uh, set up by Pope Benedict XVI. So I'm here this evening to speak about marriage. Um, sh shall we pray first? Just ask the Lord's blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, the origin of all fatherhood, the origin of all love, uh, the Trinity that we have just celebrated last Sunday, we ask you to be with us, to understand more clearly the image in which we are made, male and female, the mystery of human love, which is made to reflect the beauty of divine love. We ask Mary, the mother of your Son, to intercede for us now as we say together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, husband of the Blessed Virgin Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I've prepared this talk, and it may uh, be of interest to you or it may not, and you might have questions which are not answered in the talk, so afterwards, of course, you're free to talk about whatever you want <laughs> uh, to talk about just by asking me questions. Recently on public radio news, there was a report about a change in the law in Washington to allow adopted persons to see their original birth certificate so that they can know who their natural parents were. And as one such person who was interviewed for the program said, peace has come from being able to know who I am. I know who I look like. I know what my nationality is. As an Italian girl raised in a Norwegian household, I stood out. <laughs> now such a simple statement reveals how important identity is to us. Why was it so important for that young lady to know who I am, to know who I look like, to know her ethnic and national origins? Because she knows that she is the result of an intimate relationship between her father and her mother, whatever the circumstances of that union were, and she is therefore related to them, and our relationships define who we are. Whether or not that union was an authentically human act that expressed the covenantal relationship of a husband and wife, mutually giving the totality of each, of each to the other, that union had profound effects beyond the two persons who engaged in it. Its effects went even beyond the little girl who was conceived and who eventually wanted to know who she is. Its effects will ripple out to the end of time through all the generations that might proceed from that woman. One thing that is immediately apparent in human nature as in other species of the animal and indeed the plant kingdom, is that there is a sexual differentiation and complementarity. For the lower animals and the plants, this is purely functional. An animal or a plant does not reflect on its own sex or the sex of its fellow plants and animals. There are the natural functions and what often appear to be emotions of the male and the female in the animal kingdom but there is not a questioning or a reflecting. A male animal operates in accord with its nature as a male of that particular species. A female animal operates in accord with its nature as a female of that particular species. It does not ask, why am I this kind of animal and not that one? Why am I male and not female? Who am I? Who were my parents? 
Human beings do so reflect. It's part of a growing process. A boy begins to reflect on the fact that he exists. He is a person, a human being, separate from another human being with his own identity. He can begin to think, why am I this human being, this person, and not another? Why do I exist at all? The young boy begins to be aware of his own place in the universe, of his own specific coordinates, if you will, of his relationship and relatedness to the rest of creation. <coughs> the child will then come to an awareness that he is of one sex and not the other, that he is a boy and not a girl. And then there will be the process of gender identification, of developing the attributes typical uh, of the male sex. And from the first moment the Homo sapiens came into existence, as described in the beautiful imagery of the book of Genesis, the man observed himself and the woman, and vice versa. In the first chapter of Genesis, we read that God created man in his own image. He created them male and female. He created them. And in the second, second chapter, we are told that when the man saw the woman, he observed, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And immediately the inspired author informs us of the reason for this complementarity. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. Now if one could prescind for a moment from the church's utterly trustworthy teaching that the books of the Bible are inspired and that God is their author, one would ask, what purpose did the author of the book of Genesis have in mind when composing it? Might the inquiring minds of the people to whom the book of Genesis was addressed have been asking questions such as, why are we here? Why were we made? What is our purpose? Why are we male and female? What is the purpose of sex? It seems to me that even at a basic human level, the author is attempting to explain what is so clearly observable, including the fact that human beings are sexually differentiated into male and female. In his May 19, 2014 judgment overturning the ban on same-sex marriage in Oregon, the Honorable Michael McShane of the United States District Court for the District of Oregon writes, I believe that if we can look for a moment past gender and sexuality, we can see in these plaintiffs nothing more or less than our own families. With discernment we see not shadows lurking in closets or the stereotypes of what was once believed. Rather, we see families committed to the common purpose of love, devotion, and service to the greater community. Of course, if we look past what is staring us in the face, gender and sexuality, as Judge McShane put it, then we can conclude all kinds of things. We can conclude, as Judge McShane does, that what was once believed, and what is still deeply held by people of religious and non-religious belief uh, persuasion alike, not only but by, by belief, but by rational deduction, constitutes shadows lurking in closets or stereotypes. And such a conclusion, when such a conclusion is enshrined in a legal judgment that will be used as precedent for further legal judgments, then those who still hold to what was once believed will be deemed to hold positions contrary to the law and therefore open to ridicule as bigots at the very least, and even to prosecution should they openly express and live by such shadowy and stereotypical beliefs. Over a hundred years ago, in 1905, G.K. Chesterton wrote these prophetic words in his work, Heretics. Everything will be denied. Fires will be kindled to testify that two and two make four. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. We shall be left defending not only the incredible virtues and sanities of human life, but something more credible still. This huge impossible universe which stares us in the face. We shall fight for visible prodigies as if they were invisible. We shall look upon the impossible grass and the skies with a strange courage. We shall be of those who have seen and yet believed. 
Now, lest anyone present should think that I'm over-dramatizing the situation, the day after Judge McShane handed down his judgment, Judge John E. Jones III in the United States District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania consulted his memorandum opinion by stating that we are a better people than what these laws, which prohibited same-sex marriage, represent. And it is time to, to discard them into the ash heap of history. I think these judgments merit study because they demonstrate how the logic based on a false premise will logically lead to irrational conclusions. Much of Judge McShane's opinion refers to arguments such as stable families, welfare of children, loving relationships. The fact that children can be conceived outside sexual union by means of in vitro fertilization is given as something that undermines the arguments we would put in defense of marriage. Reference is made to tradition and religious beliefs, stating that these are not sufficient to harm the rights of people with same-sex attraction to marry. Judge McShane writes, some argue the state's interest in responsible procreation supports same-gender marriage bans. Procreation, however, is not vital to the state's interest in marriage. Procreative potential is not a marriage prerequisite. There is no prohibition to marriage to sterile, sterile or infertile persons, or upon couples who have no desire to have children. The only prohibited marriages, other than those between same-gender couples, are those involving first cousins, or those in which either party is already married. But of course, procreation was always vital to the state's interest in marriage, even if offspring did not always occur. Why is marriage prohibited between first cousins? Is it not because marriage is ordered towards the procreation of offspring, even if it might not result in such? The state rightly, generally, prohibits marriage between first cousins and the church too, generally, because of the risk of unhealthy offspring, as well as to ensure that the family, whether immediate or extended, is protected from becoming a place of sexual predation. But if marriage is simply a civil contract defined by the state, what prevents it being redefined so that cousins, or for that matter, siblings, can marry. Indeed, the union of two people of the same sex cannot produce offspring. So the state's prohibition of marriage between first cousins is superfluous, even unreasonable. So why shouldn't same-sex cousins be permitted to marry, or for that matter, same-sex siblings? And why should such unions be limited to one partner? Were we indeed to look for a moment past what is staring us in the face, namely gender and sexuality, then we can, redefi we can define marriage and family as we wish, or cease altogether to have any idea of what marriage and family truly means. McShane's argument appears to be that we can define marriage as we see fit, as long as there is no denial to one what is acknowledged as a right of another. So we see that arguments used in judgments such as McShane's can appear as reasonable if only they were based on reasonable premises. And so we must ourselves be convinced rationally, not rejecting the assistance of divine revelation, of course, of the nature of marriage and be able to explain it to others. We will proceed rationally, but with the advantage offered us by the light of faith, accepting scripture and tradition as divinely revealed, and the Church's magisterium as infallibly guided by the Holy Spirit, in no way offending against, but rather illuminating reason. When we look at one another, we immediately apprehend the physical through which we see the personal. The first thing that appears to us is our existence. Then we see that there are other human beings, and that we are distinct from them. And then we see that within the one species there are male and female, that we are either one or the other, and that therefore there is something in others that we are not. And this assists us in appreciating who and what we are. At the end of the second chapter of the book of Genesis, we read, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They observed one another in their sexual difference, 
And this mutual observation was an enlightenment, not an experience of deceitful lust that corrupted or alienated them from the life of God. It did not result in them becoming darkened in their understanding, as was the case of the Gentiles about whom St. Paul wrote in the fourth chapter of his letter to the Ephesians. Notice that the divine author, inspired, or divinely inspired author refers to the woman as the man's wife. We first read the word husband at the fall when Eve took of the fruit of the tree and ate, and she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Since Adam and Eve are husband and wife, the blessing that God had imparted to them was therefore a nuptial blessing. Although God had blessed all the creatures of the waters, commanding them to be fruitful and multiply, the blessing given to the first couple confirmed them as having been made in the image of God. His blessing included the duty to be fruitful and to multiply. And it also entrusted them with dominion over the earth and every living thing that moves upon the earth. The church defines marriage as a partnership of the whole of life. And we naturally tend to interpret this in a way that relates both to the length of life of the spouses and the totality of their being. But we could also say that the whole of life has been entrusted to those called to marriage. This is because the future generations depend on them. It is through their union that they will come into existence, and this through a mutual self-donation. As Pope St. John Paul II says in one of his audiences on the theology of the body, the human body in all the original truth of its masculinity and femininity expresses the emergence by the man from his state of original solitude into the dimension of the mutual gift. He says, the body which expresses ma masculinity and femininity manifests the reciprocity and communion of persons. It expresses it by means of the gift as the fundamental characteristic of personal existence. This is the body, a witness to creation as a fundamental gift, and so a witness to love as the source from which this same giving springs. Masculinity and femininity, namely sex, is the original sign of a creative donation and a, an awareness on the part of man, male-female, of a gift lived in an original way. And Pope St. John Paul II then develops this giftedness as oriented towards a, a finality, namely their lives as spouses' parents. He says, uniting with each other so closely as to become one flesh, they will subject their humanity to the blessing of fertility, namely procreation. Man comes into being with consciousness of this finality of his own masculinity, femininity, that is, of his own sexuality. At the same time, the words of Genesis 2.25, they were both naked and were not ashamed, seem to add to this fundamental truth of the meaning of the human body, of its masculinity and femininity, another no less essential and fundamental truth. Aware of the procreative capacity of his body and of his sexuality, man is at the same time free from constraint of his own body and sex. Or at least thus it was before the fall. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines marriage as follows. The matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life is by its nature ordered toward the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. The use of the word covenant to describe marriage is a development in the church's understanding of marriage that was given doctrinal, if not dogmatic, form in Vatican II's pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 48. Up until then, marriage had been, de been defined as a contract by which rights were mutually handed over to the spouses. In defining the object of matrimonial consent, the 1917 Code of Canon Law stated, Matrimonial consent is an act of the will by which each party gives and accepts a perpetual and exclusive right over the body for acts which are of themselves suitable 
for the generation of children. Now the definition currently used is richer in referring not to rights over the body but to the partnership of the whole of life ordered towards the good of the spouses and the procreation and education, not just the the generation of offspring. And the above mentioned pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, states that the intimate partnership of life and love established by the Creator and endowed by Him with its own proper laws is rooted in the covenant of its partners, that is, in their irrevocable, irrevocable personal consent. The partners mutually surrender themselves to each other for the good of the spouses, of the children, and of society. This sacred bond no longer depends on human decision alone. The Church stresses that marriage is established by the Creator. In other words, we can see this by simply observing creation. It has its own proper laws, that is, it serves a purpose, the good of the spouses, the good of children, the good of society. And for this reason, the the consent is irrevocable, the covenant indissoluble. And the Church calls this bond sacred. Why is it sacred? because it has a value beyond itself. And not only for the good of children and society, but because it tells us something about God and how he relates to his people. God speaks to us about himself and his relationship with us in terms of the marriage covenant. We're familiar with the covenant that God struck with Moab. Noah, I will establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. This was a binding agreement made by God, freely given, not even asking for a corresponding agreement on the part of the other party. Then there is the covenant with Abraham, by which God promised that Abraham would be the father of a multitude of nations. God sealed the covenant by passing in the form of a flaming torch between the halves of the animals that Abraham had, had cut in two, as if to say, let me be cut in half if I am not faithful to this covenant. God makes a covenant with Moses on Mount Sinai. Tell the sons of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all peoples. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And God gives Moses the commandments. Now where is marriage referred to as a covenant in the Bible? In the book of Malachi, and with some very strong words. You ask, Why does the Lord no longer regard your offering or accept it with favour at your hand? Because the Lord was witness to the covenant between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Has not the one God made and sustained for us the spirit of life? And what does he desire? Godly offspring. So take heed to yourselves and let none be faithless to the wife of his youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. Malachi 2, 14 through 16. The reason God hates divorce is that he himself has experienced marital breakdown. His bride Israel has been unfaithful and gone with other gods, the Baals. She decked herself with her ring and jewellery and went after her lovers and forgot me, says the Lord. So the Lord sets out on a plot to recover her. I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And in that day, says the Lord, you will call me my husband and I will espouse you forever. I will espouse you in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will espouse you in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. The ultimate wooing of his bride, of course, takes place when God sends his son to take our flesh. But he came to his own home and his own people received him not. 
John the Baptist recognizes Jesus as the bridegroom. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus identifies himself with the bride as the bridegroom. When asked why John the Baptist's disciples fast, but his do not. Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. When St. Paul describes the mystery of Christ and the church, he uses marriage to help people understand. The husband is head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. So God loves his people as a husband his wife. Christ loves the church as a husband his wife. St. Paul says that Christian husbands must love their Christian wives in the same way that Christ loves the church. Marriage language is essential if we are to understand God, Jesus Christ, the church. And so the marriages of Christians are to be signs, sacraments of that relationship of Christ and his church. Indeed, the church completes the definition of marriage quoted above in the catechism by adding, the covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. And the Code of Canon Law continues, for this reason, a valid matrimonial contract cannot exist between the baptized without it being by that fact a sacrament. And St. Paul quotes Genesis 2.24, just as our Lord does when asked whether it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife. From the beginning of creation, our Lord says, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And our Lord goes on when his disciples asked him further about this matter. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So we therefore have some very clear teaching from our Lord, who is not just a wise teacher, but the one through whom all things were made, as we say every Sunday on the Nicene Creed. As St. Paul writes in him, all things were created, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the same one who spoke through the prophet Malachi, I hate divorce. So let's examine the situation of Catholics who are divorced and remarried and whether or not they might be admitted to Holy Communion and the other sacraments. Because it is this that seems to have become the focus uh, of media attention and general discussion among people both within and outside the church. And Pope Francis showed some irritation about this when he was asked uh, during the press conference on the plane on the way back from the Holy Land on May 25th this year, What is going to happen with communion to the divorced and remarried? The Holy Father replied that he has not been happy that so many people, even church people, priests, have said, ah, the synod will be about giving communion to the divorced. And went straight to that point. I felt as if everything was being reduced to casuistry. No, the issue is bigger and wider. Today, as we all know, the family is in crisis. It is in crisis worldwide. Young people don't want to get married. They don't get married or they live together. Marriage is in crisis, and so the family is in crisis. I don't want us to fall into this casuistry of can we or can't we. So I thank you so much for this question, because it gives me the opportunity to clarify this. So, okay, the synod is about much more than communion for the divorced and remarried, but we're still going to look at it. (laughs) What can we say about this topic? Well, positively, we must stress the church's care for those of her children who are in this situation is is obvious. 
in his apostolic exhortation Familiaris Consortio on the Christian family in the modern world, Pope St. John Paul II, earnestly called upon pastors and the whole community of the faithful to help the divorced, and with solicitous care to make sure that they do not consider themselves as separated from the church. For as baptized persons, they can and indeed must share in her life. They should be encouraged to listen to the word of God, to attend the sacrifice of the Mass, to persevere in prayer, to contribute to works of charity, and to bring up their children in the Christian faith, to implore day by day God's grace. Let the Church pray for them, encourage them, and show herself a merciful mother, and thus sustain them in faith and hope. However, the Church reaffirms her practice, which is based upon sacred scripture, of not admitting to Eucharistic communion divorced persons who have remarried. Why? They are unable to be admitted thereto from the fact that their state and condition of life objectively contradict that union of love between Christ and the Church, which is signified and effected by the Eucharist. So says Pope John Paul II. Now, many of you may have heard of the suggestions proposed by Cardinal Casper at the February 2014 Consistory of Cardinals concerning the problem of the divorced who are remarried. Cardinal Casper, um, they were meant not to be published, but then they were published in an Italian uh, newspaper. Um, and uh, so they're, they're available if you read Italian. Cardinal Casper begins his remarks on this problem by, by saying that the rapidly growing number of broken families appears as an ever greater tragedy, which results in a great deal of suffering for so many. He says that the Church's response to this problem cannot be reduced to the question of their admission to Holy Communion. But his proposals certainly concern this very topic. In suggesting a via media between rigorism, rigorism and laxity, and a process that would result in the readmission of the divorced and remarried to the sacramental life of the Church without a declaration of nullity from an ecclesiastical tribunal, he seeks to assure us that this possible way would not be a general solution. It is not the broad way of the great many, rather the narrow path for a probably small number of the divorced and remarried sincerely desiring the sacraments. My experience as a pastor and my work in tribunals tells me that the numbers are by no means small, but that very many are in this situation. Cardinal Casper quotes Pope St. John Paul II, Apostolic Exhortation Familiaris Consortio, which affirms that some who are divorced and remarried are subjectively convinced in their own consciences that their previous marriages are irreme irre irre irremediably broken and were never valid. The Cardinal then says that many pastors of souls are convinced that many marriages celebrated in a religious ceremony are not contracted in a valid manner, and he wonders if the Church's presumption of validity of marriage is nothing more than a fixio juris, a legal fiction. Well, that attitude that many or most marriages are probably not valid is not uncommon. But to sustain such a cynical position, however, is to cast out on the sincerely made promises of so many people at the time that they got married. It could be likened to the good lay faithful going to Mass and being in doubt Sunday after Sunday as to whether or not the priest celebrating Mass is validly ordained we need to be able to presume that the priest is indeed a priest and that the Mass and other sacraments he celebrates are valid. In the same way, we must assume that those who are in the married state are in fact married. And this is summed up in the pithy but all-important words of Canon 1060 of the Code of Canon Law. Marriage possesses the favour of the law. Therefore, in a case of doubt, the validity of a marriage must be upheld until the contrary is proven. That's the standard of judgment that we use in the tribunal. If a judge remains in doubt as to whether a marriage is valid, he 
he must uphold its validity. It's only when that doubt is removed and he is morally certain that the marriage he is examining was not valid, then he can de declare its nullity. Otherwise he must at least say not null, which is what we say. Non constat de nullitari, de nullitari, not null. The nullity has not been found, which means we presume the marriage to be valid. Cardinal Casper suggests that rather than subject such marriages, that is, those in which a person is subjectively convinced that his or her previous marriage was never valid, to the judgment of ecclesiastical tribunals, that they be entrusted to a priest with spiritual and pastoral experience, acting as a penitentiary or, episc or episcopal vicar. In my opinion, this would place an enormous burden on the shoulders of one man. The reason why the church prefers marriages to be judged by three judges, although that is not always the case, and why a decision in favour of the nullity of the bond must be automatically referred to an appeals tribunal for verification prior to going to, into effect is because of the serious responsibility before God of declaring a marriage null. What therefore God has joined together let not man put asunder. Perhaps the most discussed part of Cardinal Casper's paper concerns the possible adoption by the Catholic Church of the practice of pastoral tolerance, whereby the Eastern Orthodox churches allow their members to enter into a new union after a period of penance. In proposing such a practice, Cardinal Casper appeals to Canon 8 of the Council of Nicaea, which took place in the year 325, which states... Concerning those who call themselves Qatari, the heret an heretical group, if they come over to the Catholic and Apostolic Church, the great and holy synod decrees that they will communicate, that is, share Eucharistic communion, with persons who have been twice married. Cardinal Casper quotes scholarship, which was discredited, discredited even at the time of its publication over 30 years ago suggesting that this reference to persons who have been twice married must have referred to those who had divorced and remarried. It does not. Such a situation was never tolerated in the early church. The twice married in this canon are those who have married again following the death of their first spouse. The Qatari refused to have fellowship with such people, refused to admit them to the Eucharist whereas the Catholic Church upheld the right of anyone to marry again after the death of their spouse. The unchanging tradition of the Church is clear. The sacramental bond of marriage is indissoluble. Anyone who opposes this teaching sets themselves against Christ. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. The plight of those in failed marital relations is truly of great concern to the Church. Surely we can understand the following statement of an Eastern Orthodox theologian. The Orthodox Church admits, the Eastern Orthodox Church, admits divorce and remarriage as a concession to human frailty and imperfection. These concessions reflect the Church's pastoral concern for wounded souls, as well as her refusal to abandon divorced persons in their sin, failure, weakness, guilt, and or pain. The ultimate aim of the Church in tolerating divorce is the restoration of the dignity and holiness both of the institution of marriage and of the human person who bears the pain of dissolution of the marital bonds. We can have some sympathy with that very you know, sort of uh, concerned approach to those who have divorced and remarried. And this merciful approach is something that Cardinal Casper seeks. He first confirms Catholic doctrine. One cannot propose a solution that, diverge, that diverges from or is contrary to the words of Jesus. The indissolubility of a sacramental marriage and the impossibility of a new marriage during the lifetime of the other partner forms part of the tradition of the binding faith of the Church that cannot be abandoned or dissolved by an appeal to superficial understanding of cheap mercy. But he goes on. Since God is faithful, he is also merciful. And in his mercy, he is also faithful, even if we might be unfaithful. Mercy and faithfulness go together. Because of the merciful faithfulness of God, there is no human situation that is absolutely derived, deprived of hope or of a solution. However low a man can fall, 
he can never fall beyond the reach of God's mercy. All all true. Cardinal Casper states, mercy does not exclude justice, and it cannot be understood as a grace bought cheaply as if bought in a sale. Pastoral care and mercy are not opposed to justice, but they are, as it were, the supreme justice, because behind every case they, the rotal judges, judges in tribunals, see not only a case to be examined through the lens of a general rule, but a human person who, as such, can never represent a case and always has a unique dignity. Yet how should this divine mercy be expressed by the Church? Cardinal Gerhard Muller, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, gave his thoughts on the matter in an article published in Losavita Romano in October last year. He writes, The entire sacramental economy is a work of divine mercy, and it cannot simply be swept aside by an appeal to the same. An objectively false appeal to mercy also runs the risk of trivializing the image of God by implying that God cannot do other than forgive. The mystery of God includes not only his mercy, but also his holiness and his justice. If one were to suppress these characteristics of God and refuse to take sin seriously, ultimately it would not even be possible to bring God's mercy to man. God's mercy does not dispense us from following his commandments. Rather, it supplies us with the grace and strength needed to fulfill them, to pick ourselves up after a fall, and to live life in its fullness according to the image of our Heavenly Father. And Cardinal Muller's article is entitled Testimony to the Power of Grace, and it's significant that such a title be chosen. The Ukrainian Greek Catholic theologian Bogdan Puska wrote concerning the Eastern Orthodox theology that it considers the teaching about marriage as sacrament to be in collision with the practical, empirical reality of fallen human life. It appears, just as the gospel in its totality, an unrealizable ideal. If marriage and the gospel as a whole are simply law, then they are unrealizable. They are an unrealizable ideal. But under the order of grace, All things are possible. The Lord is calling us by grace to live according to our true dignity. Not only is it possible for marriage to be lived as it was meant to be lived from the beginning, but even in the higher dignity that it now has as a sacrament between the baptized, a sign of Christ's faithful love for the church. What can we pray for and hope for from the forthcoming October Synod on the Family? The theme of the Synod is pastoral challenges to the family in the context of evangelization. As Pope Francis said, this Synod is not solely about the divorced and the remarried. It is about the family that is in crisis worldwide. It is about pastoral care and evangelization. At a charismatic renewal convention in Rome on June 1st this year, Pope Francis spoke about the attacks on the family. He said, Families are the domestic church where Jesus grows, grows in the love of spouses, grows in the life of the children. It is because of this that the enemy so attacks the family. The devil does not want it and he seeks to destroy it. He acts so that love will not exist there. Families are this domestic church. Spouses are sinners, as everyone is. But they wish to go forward in the faith, in their fruitfulness, in the children, and in the faith of the children. May the Lord bless the family. May he make it strong in this crisis in which the devil wants to destroy it. Once we wake up to the deliberate attack by the evil one upon marriage and the family. We will take evangelization seriously. And why does the evil one want to attack marriage and the family? Because marriage and the family are the image of God. That's why he wants to attack it. Why is this work of evangelization of such vital importance? Because if we do not understand marriage, we cannot understand God's relationship with his creation 
Christ's relationship with the church and our own relatedness to one another. The surveys that have taken place around the world show that indeed there is, in Cardinal Casper's words, and as every bishop already knew, an abyss between the doctrine of the church concerning marriage and the family and the lived convictions of many Christians. On the other hand, as Cardinal Casper says, there are thousands of families who do their very best to live the faith of the church and who give testimony to the beauty and joy of the faith lived in the womb of the family. How should the abyss between doctrine and lived convictions be filled? By changing the doctrine? Or by bearing witness to the truth and beauty of marriage? Pope Francis, like popes before him, wants the church to reach out to the family so that the family may be restored as a sign of Christ's love for the church and the world, that it may be defended from the attacks of the enemy, and that those who have been wounded and hurt through marital breakdown may find healing and be restored to the means of salvation. To speak about marriage is to evangelize. Authentic married life proclaims and announces the gospel of God's love for the world. As Pope Francis said recently, the image of God is the married couple, the man and the woman. This is the image of God, love. God's covenant with us is represented in that covenant between man and woman. Let us pray that the Holy Spirit will guide the members of this extraordinary synod. The marriage may be renewed so as to show forth more fully the image of God to our world. Thank you. <laughs> I can speak without a script, so if you have any questions. <laughs> Why aren't we hearing this more from the pulpit? Why aren't we hearing more from the pulpit, Father Stephen? <laughs> a question from your parishioner. <laughs> Well, um, you, don't, you can't be hearing about marriage every Sunday. And yet, somehow, you, you know, every, every Sunday Mass is a, is a celebration of marriage. You know, blessed are those called to the nuptial supper of the Lamb. You know, every Mass is marriage. So, I think I, th I get the impression marriage is spoken about quite a bit, but I don't know. I don't know about in your parish. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can we do? We have the Nancy Pelosi writing letters to you know, the bishop in San Francisco. Yeah. We have every other person on the street telling you you're wrong for your thoughts, and I don't believe in your God, so why should I believe what you believe? I mean, what, what can we what can we Yeah. Well, you know, the Christian is always called to bear witness. And in fact, as I was talking to one of the young people earlier, it came up in, I think, the Sunday before Ascension Sunday. St. Peter, in the second reading, told us that we are to bear witness um, with reverence and gentleness. But still, not to be surprised if we get defamed and attacked and all the rest, you know, just as Christ, the innocent one, humble one was attacked, you know. So that's the call, really. We just bear witness. <clears throat> we can't convince people of the truth if they don't want to believe it. But um, if, if, they're, if they're openly and sincerely you know, open to a dialogue based on reason, then you can discuss reality. <clears throat> you know, I mean, as Judgment Shane says, if you 
go if you look beyond gender and sexuality you can decide what you want but just have a look you know look at the at the body you know do you know what a male body looks like do you know what a female body looks like so you know what what are they for um and uh you know so i think i think there's a a, a breakdown in what reality is and so people live in a fantasy world um because they don't really know what how they are meant to be so as as faithful catholics uh, or christians you know in marriage really i just want to encourage you to live your vocation to live your vocation as a husband and wife realizing that as pope francis says that's the image of god the man and the woman becoming one flesh is the image of god by raising your your children by taking notes that your marriage is a partnership of the whole of life in that the whole of life is entrusted to you a same-sex couple can't produce life sterile you know um and we you know with the church is trying it seeks to try and heal the lives of those whose marriages are broken through breakdown and we have the tribunals to you know to work there towards discovering the truth so we want to heal their lives if we can and get them onto a new start in a true bond of marriage but of itself divorce and those who have been through divorce know this that it's hurtful it damages and it's not good for children once you realize that your vocation as married couples embraces a partnership of the whole dedicated to the whole of life i think you realize the grandeur of your vocation and how the two of you husband and wife are living sacraments i always say you know if i see <coughs> john and mary you know before they're married i just see john and mary after they're married i see christ in the church and i often you know when i'm doing a, talking to the couples or preaching in a wedding i say you know we we expect of you as of now to be a sign to the rest of us of christ's love for the church that's the high calling you have and i think with the help of god's grace people can rise to that calling if they're made aware of it so i just encourage you to be faithful in your respective calling It's, it's a, difficult to know, you know, how to answer specifically your problem, but I think we uh, we have to be aware. And, and Pope Francis is, has been great, really, at not being afraid to talk about the devil, you know. And uh, 
on a retreat that I've just come off, a priest's retreat for the Archdiocese of Portland. So all the priests who went on this retreat a couple of weeks ago in Mount Angel, given by a Jesuit called Father Bill Watson, who's based in Seattle. He, 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 um, he founded and is the executive director of something called the Sacred Story Institute. Now, when I first saw that, I thought, oh no, this is going to be very new agey, you know. I tell you, he was as sound as a bell. And he, he, he spoke... Um, you know, it gave a wonderful, coherent picture of creation as interrelated and a beautiful plan, harmonious, beautiful, true. What is, what is the devil, what, what does the devil want to do? He's anti-truth, anti-beauty, anti-harmony, anti-Christ, you know. So the destruction of the human being made in the image of God is the devil's plan. Um... That, that's his plan, to destroy us. Why? Because we are greater than he in many ways. You know, the Lord, uh, in the, the Psalms sing about how we are you know, almost as great, greater than the angels, really, because the, God became incarnate, took on human flesh. And that's the beauty that we are. You see, we, we should, <clears throat> when we look at things, we should accept them as they are. And this is where there's no, there's a complete loss of truth. You take things and, and um, uh, I think Dietrich von Hildebrand speaks about this in a beautiful look, a book about personality and liturgy. You should read it. Because it, by going to Mass and allowing the Mass to be celebrated as it's meant to be celebrated, not as we, not, not manipulating it, we learn about what it is to be a true person, you know. Uh, it's the same, we, so, so we see things, we give them the value that they have, and we should accept creation as given. We should, we should accept human nature as given. And we shouldn't manipulate things into something that they're not meant to be, above all, human nature. Now, how does that answer your quandary there about all these rights? It's a difficult one, isn't it? I think we're, we're in a time when the rights of others, so-called rights, are going to be upheld when our rights uh, are going to be um, trampled on. But wasn't it ever the case? Haven't Christians always uh, experienced that and been prepared to suffer and die for it? You know, so welcome to the age of martyrdom. <laughs> and someone mentioned there about Nancy Pelosi and all the rest. You know, I don't know why she has not been told she can't receive Holy Communion. I don't know why she hasn't been, why, why uh, Archbishop Cordiglione, who is her bishop, you know, ha hasn't. But that's his, I, I don't know, and he's a good bishop, he's a good archbishop, what, lion, you know, heart of lion, you know. He's yeah, he's responded, but he hasn't, he, none, of, none of the, none of the, the only bishop I know who took action against a politician was uh, the then Archbishop Burke, you know, Bishop Burke. Um, so that's, that's a question you have to put to the bishops. They have their reasons, and I, I don't know why they wouldn't have done that. So, yeah. Don't you think tolerance is a very low bar? It <laughs> sets the bar very low. We should love one another, <laughs> not just tolerate. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tolerate, I'll put up with you, you know. That's very low. It very, sets the bar very, we should love one another, we should love our enemies. And, and of course, we should love people, but not error. We should not tolerate error. You know, error has to be confronted uh, and entered into uh, battle with in all kinds of ways. It can be entered in head on, it can be entered into in a more you know, dialogue, way, through friendship, try and be friends with, with people. Um, but, you know, it, it's so important it will fail. I'll give you a personal um, illustration of this, which, um, you know, the, uh, the seeds of uh, kind of bored fruit, as, as is in the news today in another part of the United States. Soon after I arrived in my parish in Gwynn, Michigan, in the Diocese of Marquette, the then Bishop Sample had appointed me there, a funeral was uh, scheduled to take place, and so I got the call. And it was, um, it was a weekend coming, so I wanted to get going on arranging this funeral. 
and I was trying to contact the family and lo and, all, lo and behold I got a phone call you know, from someone who said, oh I'm so and so, um, I'm one of the family and I'd like to, you know, I'd, uh, like to help arrange the music. And I always worry, oh God, you know, what music, what music are you going to suggest? Well, I said, well that's great because at least I can work together with someone. So, well, I was hoping to meet the family tonight. I said, great, well, we'll meet tonight. So he was going to go there. As soon as I went there, I realized there's something strange here. Something strange is going on. And I just kept quiet. I felt very nervous, you know. But it's clear that there was a homosexual thing going on here. Uh, so, um, and then I heard from a, another priest that, uh, you know, this guy, you know, is, is in a same-sex sort of relationship. And then when the obituary was out in the paper, he declared the son of the deceased as his spouse. You know how they put it in parentheses. Oh, that's right. He had, he had told me, oh, I'm so-and-so's son-in-law. <laughs> you know. So when I called him up, I said, you told me you were his son-in-law. How do you become a son-in-law by getting married? Are, are, are you married? You, you, know, you, you marry the, the daughter, don't you? And so it went on. So I said, well, you can't... You, you, you know, you do come to the funeral, but you can't be cantor. You can't have any ministerial role in this funeral mass. Well, it hit the local papers and, you know, went all, went all around, you know. The funeral was taken, they, did, they took the funeral out of the parish. Today, in the news in Marquette, this very same person, on Saturday, went to a, a public commitment ceremony to his partner. And the parish priest has said, you can't be cantor, you can't do this. It's now in the news. And the Bishop of Marquette has had to go on television to explain why. So you, you can go through all the dialogue. I tried to dialogue. The priest tried to dialogue. Sometimes you go through all that dialogue. Close minds and they'll bite you in the end. You know, the devil will bite you. But that's the risk we take. You know, we, we... I, um, I, I understand the sentiments and... I just wonder, you know, as part of the tribunal, have you come across situations where you actually have approved of an enrollment? Many, many. We're, we're churning them out every day. <laughs> now, it's not to say that it's a conveyor belt, but no, literally, we, it is not difficult to get a declaration of nullity if your marriage is null. If you can provide us with the information, it is not difficult. But, we, but it, there, is a, there is a thorough process to go through. This idea that it's difficult to get a declaration of nullity, it does, it's not true. And it, and it becomes more, you know, as, as society fragments and as marriage becomes, the image of marriage gets more and more broken. The, the fact is that more and more people are entering into marriage without understanding what marriage is. So, it, you know, sadly, as divorce increases, so does the incidence of null marriages increase. You know, uh, I mean, I know priests who, from other countries where divorce hardly exists. 
you know, their tribunal ticks over, oh, we'll have a case now and then, a case here, a case there, you know, oh, wow, great. But once divorce gets into that society, the tribunal gets busy because, sadly, more and more people are entering into marriages which are not valid. Now, you're right, in, in, it, is the, it is the parties who minister the marriage to one another uh, before God, witnessed by the church. So, but, you know, when that, that's, that sacrament is something which cannot just disappear. It's either there or it was never there. Uh, Oh. Well, because they're, they're, that's, you know, they, they marry in good faith, but sometimes, you know, they don't know the mind of the other partner. They don't know what was going in, on in their lives. There can be things of their upbringing that have skewed their understanding of marriage. There can be all sorts of reasons why people uh, enter into a marriage in good faith, um, but the bond might not come into effect. But once a bond exists, you see, we ha even you know, theologically it makes sense that you know, the bond cannot be broken, but ultimately we have to be faithful to the Lord. If God has joined these two together, man cannot tear asunder. And that applies to the couple themselves. You know, once they're married, they are bound to remain with one another. Now, if, be if it becomes intolerable, obviously... Any pastoral minister would say, look, this is intolerable for your own good and good of the family. Maybe the only reason is way forward is to separate. And to secure economic well-being and independence, maybe you have to go to the divorce courts, you know, and get to sort out custody and everything. But um, that doesn't mean that the bond that God, you know, with which God joined them has been sundered. If there's a bond, only death can dissolve it. If there's no bond, then the church tribunal can investigate and declare it null. You know? So, I'll tell you, you know, my day is pretty much filled with reading stories of people's lives and trying to, trying to help them. And uh, Cardinal Casper makes exactly the point you make, are we using communion as a weapon? But it's communion is the sign of the... Uh, of the, the union of Christ the bridegroom with his church. I can't go to communion if I'm living a life which is not in keeping with the gospel, with my being a member of the church which is bride to Christ. Um, so we try, but I, don't, I can't answer your question probably because it doesn't, uh, doesn't reach to the distress that you see in your family. But, um, and I can't deny the distress. Uh, but the church is trying to help those people. If, you're, if your family members would like to approach the tribunal, I'd encourage it. We're there. We're there. We're there for them. And that's where I think our evangelization should begin with people who have to be. Well, I think the evangelization begins by those who are married, you know, discovering that their, their marriages are instruments, of, are, are actually means of evangelization. Um, and reaching out to those who are sadly in broken situations. No? Um, Father, is, uh, do you think that secular government should have the right to marry people? And are we as Christians, uh, is it expected by the church that we go to the government to have our marriage qualify? Or? As things stand, in the, the Code of Canon Law prohibits marriages that cannot be recognized civilly without the permission of the local ordinary. So the bishop would have to grant permission for a marriage that is only to be celebrated in the church without any civil recognition. Um, I don't see anything... Uh, I think, it, you know, the state... You know, in, in, on the surface, I think, has, a, has an obligation uh, to support marriage. Uh, in a sense, the bond of marriage should be recognized civilly. You know, you, you, 
uh, rights of children, because precisely because of all the reasons that were stated in that perverse statement by Judge McShane, you know, family security, stability, you know, that's, that's, that's what it's there for. So yes, I think the state should, and I don't, some people have advocated the church pull out and say, we're not, we're not going to do, we're not going to bother having our marriages registered in, in the state. If people want their marriages registered civilly, well, they can go to the, the courthouse and have it done there. I'm not of that view because I think we, on the face of it, recognition by the state is surely a benefit. It should be. So why not make use of the fact that the, church, the state allows us priests to witness marriages and at the same time it causes them recognition in the civil forum? The reason I ask is because the state views like same-sex marriage in the same light as... It doesn't matter what the state does, we know what it means. <laughs> But I, I take your point. I take your point. Yeah. But and that's why some canonists would say, yeah, let's let's uh, have nothing more to do with the state because they don't understand what marriage is. But we do. Um, the state can recognise it. So. That's for you lay people to get out there and be socially involved and, and all the rest. But, uh, you know, I, I, I wonder now, that, that, uh, that ballot was, what, 10 years ago? I just wonder, you know, whether today people would still vote in the same way that they did 10 years ago. Times have changed. I don't have that same confidence, but I'm not an Oregonian and haven't lived here very long. You know, so you might have a better sense of the pulse. But. Very difficult. I mean, and uh, I mean, I, dis- I discovered last summer when I visited home one of my cousins. You know, she's in a same-sex relationship, and kind of, I saw the two of them there when I visited my aunt and uncle. And then when one of them had gone, I said, "Are they, are they together?" And my aunt said, "Yeah, but she's my daughter." You know. So I think the first thing again is love. Second is to try and understand it. If you can do do a bit of reading about it, there's. Um, uh, there's a movement in the church called Courage. People who, are, who um, experience same-sex attraction and actually want to live chaste lives, Courage is an organization for them. It uh, doesn't seek to change them, except to help them to live, uh, to live fulfilled lives, even if they remain experiencing same-sex attraction. Some people who get, 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 get into Courage as you do change and enter into happy uh, marriages. But certainly reading some of the literature of courage has helped me understand, you know, what, what, can, what can have led someone to um, adopt uh, the, you know, that sort of what's termed the gay lifestyle, which courage makes the point actually that that is a very uh, incorrect way of labeling someone. Uh, and, 
Um, but um, uh, be with them. The thing of attending ceremonies is uh, very difficult and you know in, in principle I'd probably try and un ask for understanding and say well you know I'd rather not but um, I think that's a decision to make in counselling with a good spiritual director or advisor for that particular situation. Sometimes it's a question of weighing up what you would gain versus what you would lose. Um, will your presence be uh, construed as an as an approval or, or not? Or not? You know. Uh, hmm? It's difficult. difficult. I, I, in a forum like this, I wouldn't want to give a a general answer. Um, and I'm not a you know I'm a canon lawyer, but I'm not. I, you know, I have a good, experience, good idea of moral theology, but I'm not a moral theologian. And I would defer such a question to a moral theologian, to be honest. But, um, but spiritually, I would speak with you personally and talk about your, those particular, your particular circumstances. Just remember what my aunt said. She's my daughter. And my uncle was raging, apparently, when he discovered. You know, and she had to sit him down and said, she's our daughter. Um, and I think if you try and understand same-sex attraction, then then it will help you understand the person. Remember what Pope Francis said. To be fair, you know that he was out in another one of his aircraft interviews. <laughs> <laughs> God dear. You know, he said, "What do I see first? Do I see the homosexual or do I see the person? I see the person. That's what I see. I don't see, you know." Uh, homosexual, lesbian, or whatever, you know. I see the person. That's what Christ encounters first, is the person. I think it's very helpful. And there, there, are, there are things about upbringing, and that's why I mentioned earlier about there's that sexual identification, I'm a boy, I'm a girl, and then the gender identification, which is, okay, so do I accept this, what a boy is, you know. And uh, there can be all kinds of reasons why uh, a boy or a girl may not have fully identified with who they are uh, as, as, a, as a youth. Does it seem like there's more of this? Is it, yeah. Is it this morbid? Is there any scientific explanation for it? Is there something in it? Yeah, there are scientific explanations. I mean, you know, sometimes there's... Hmm? Things in the, it can be hormonal things in the womb, which don't differentiate the sex, but can affect other sort of developmental things. It can be um, uh, environmental things at home, how a child relates to the mother, how a child relates to the father. For example, a boy will, will be with his mother much more, but to develop into a boy and a man, he has somehow to separate from the mother. And for, to do that, there has to be a good father figure, you see, for him to then become identified as, 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 as a male, you know. Um, whereas a girl, there's no need to separate from the mother in that way because the, the, the default is feminine. <laughs> you know? The boy, you know, has to struggle more to, to identify as the male. Then if the father, you know, some boys are more sensitive than others. And if the father doesn't approve of that boy's sensitivity, then that boy thinks he's not normal. And so may go to a, a homosexual lifestyle. Whereas if the, boy, if the dad says, you know, I really love it if you came hunting with me, but you don't, you don't like hunting, that's fine, okay. What do you, you like music, you like painting, you like the arts. That's all right, son. You know, you don't like the, rock, the locker room, you don't like playing football because of the locker room. Okay, son, doesn't matter that you're not a footballer. You can be a perfectly fine man without being interested in sport. But sometimes it's the lack of affirmation of those things that so, you know, I, I'm not living up to what it is to be a man. You know, so all sorts of things can, can uh, be background. Yeah. Would you say that that explanation would survive over 2,000 years ago to today? So the Roman era, the Roman era? So 
So are you, are you talking about sort of homoerotic practices in certain civilizations? Well, you gave an explanation of the nature and nurture. Yeah. One was chemical, one was nurture, one was familial yeah. bonding and all that. Is, would that survive, would that explanation survive over all the different terms of time? You know, I'm not an expert, but from what I read, that's sort of what modern research has found, has found you know. So uh, that's I'm only going on, on the sort of reading that I've done on it. Um, but there's a difference between explore, you know, having had homoerotic experiences and being homosexual. Um, those are, there is a difference. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, the Greeks were at it all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, so they might have done it, might have been somehow part of the society, but yet doesn't mean that they were homosexual. You know, they did sin, you know, sinful things, but... So it's complicated, and I, I, that I haven't done the research to present it in a talk, but I, I'm only telling you a little bit of reading that I've done on, on things through Courage. Courage is a great uh, organization if you want to know more from a Catholic perspective. Yep, I'm watching Father Stevens. One last question. Okay, last question. Um, Lady in the front here. <laughs> Um, but a gay man who is in a complete accord with the church's teaching on marriage did make the point that he feels like homosexual sins are graded on a much different scale than heterosexual sins and that um, especially in regard to marriage, um, uh, you know, he said that it's not uncommon today for um, couples to have been cohabiting for That's right, yeah. uh, months, sometimes years, and then Yes. For the sacrament of marriage, and um, I was wondering if you could um, comment on that, and yep. if the church can do anything. To sure. Well, it's again about, about pro presenting a co coherent teaching on sexuality. So, the lady at the front was saying that you know homosexual sins are sometimes seen as being considered more serious than you know sins of uh, between of unchastity between people of the opposite sex. So all those sins of unchastity are, are serious sins. Yet uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the homosexual inclination is of itself, we, we use the word disordered because it's not the way we're meant to be, you know. Whereas it's not, uh, um, the attraction of a man to a woman is of itself not disordered, but it can become out of order. <laughs> You know, when it goes beyond the bounds, or when it doesn't respect the boundaries of chastity. You know, you know uh, so there's a certain disorder there, but it, but it's not. It's a different kind of disorder. Um, certainly, in the scriptures, the home sins of you know sins of Sodom are being considered with particular um, severity um, because they go so contrary to uh, to to the nature of things. Um, and so I think the homosexual inclination is also it's acknowledged in the catechism as a particular cross for those who accept it as such and they realize, well, they experience same-sex attraction but want to live a faithful Catholic life. It is experienced as a cross. But in cases where, you know, like I said, heterosexual couples have been living together yeah. um, for months or perhaps years. Years before marriage, yeah. Does, you know, does a pastor ever uh, require them to Live apart for a period of time. You can't require them as such, but um, to, you can't require a couple who are living together to live apart because that of itself is not an, not an impediment to marriage, but it's a very poor, poor preparation for marriage. Um, some, again, you know, experience in the tribunal, reading stories, you know, um, but they've been living together. So, so, so how was the honeymoon? The romance is gone, you know. Uh, usually, the honeymoon, they're looking forward to that first night, aren't they? You know, well, it's no big deal, really. You know, she was tired, so <laughs> we didn't bother. <laughs> I don't know, you know. So it's a very poor preparation for marriage, but they are. Thank you, Father Boyle, for a very clear and thoughtful presentation. Thank you.